Just get ready a second. <laughs> we all know why we're here, I hope. Today's session is If Walls Could Talk, Can Signs Help Build Public Trust? Uh, I'm a new county court administrator, and I have uh, been confounded in my court with looking at people and seeing that they have nowhere to, to find out where to go. So when I saw this session uh, on the calendar, I was really excited and so excited that uh, I wanted to host it. We do have a couple of announcements that you've probably heard before. Uh, these programs are, uh, in many cases, live streamed. Uh, so there's a camera back there and hopefully many people out across the country uh, watching. Uh, what we would like to do is if you have a question, and you can ask a question at any time, plus there's interactive portions of this presentation, uh, please wait for me to get to you with a microphone so that the people online can hear. Uh, covered questions really quickly. Uh, I don't want to spend uh, too much time, but I would like to just very briefly introduce our speakers today. Uh, Lisa Howard is the Bureau Chief Clerk for Manhattan Criminal Court. Uh, she served 24 years across all five boroughs. That's correct. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Jeopardy question. <laughs> Name all five bureaus. <laughs> boroughs. Oh. Anyone? You can. Of course I can. <laughs> yes. No, you're not allowed. Oh, I will not. <laughs> uh, and this is Emily Lagrada. She is an author and deputy director of training and technical assistance and director of procedural justice initiatives at the Center for Court Innovation. Uh, Again, I'm really excited. I hope you're as excited as I am about the presentation. And without further ado, let's roll. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, that certainly was an inspiring morning plenary, so we'll do our best to keep the momentum of that. Um, it's really an honor to be here with all of you and to be with my awesome uh, co-presenter here, Lisa Thank Howard. You. I'm just so thrilled that she was able to make the trek yes. and that you. the um, New York State courts could live without her for a few days. So, um, so just by quick introductions of kind of who we are and why we're here. Um, I work for a nonprofit called the Center for Court Innovation, which has partnered with the New York State courts for about 20 years to help make some justice system improvements there. Um, and in addition to an in-house research department that we also have, um, we have a consulting shop or a training and technical assistance uh, department that I work for. So I get to travel the country and um, present to folks like yourselves and sometimes even partner more directly with jurisdictions as they work to implement, implement um, various reform efforts, whether it's alternatives to incarceration or thinking about how to build trust and confidence. Uh, with, with communities, between communities and the justice system. So that kind of tees up why we're here today. And um, Lisa is uh, a really impressive veteran of the court system, um, who we had the pleasure of working with on a variety of projects, but most recently an effort in the Manhattan Criminal Courthouse, which we'll tell you more about, but I'm sure images come to mind of the type of activity um, and the scale of activity that takes place there, but an effort to see if we could um, use signage as part of an effort to build trust and confidence um, in a very complex system. So thank you all. Um, so just quick show of hands before we proceed. I'm curious how many of you feel that you spend quite a bit of time thinking about how you message to the public, how you communicate with the public? Great, so I think that's about 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so what this, uh, what this session is about is extending our view of how the actual built environment where we work is part of that messaging. Um, I've been to lots of courthouses uh, in, in my current role and almost all of them, if not all, have some messages that the walls are communicating that are inconsistent um, or are taking away from the messages that the very well-meaning professionals who work there are communicating. Um, and so that's really what this is about. And, and more, you know, Lisa and I are kind of justice professionals. Yes. We're not graphic designers or architects mm -hmm. or the like. Um, so, so what does the justice system have to contribute to this? Well, in fact, there's a lot of research around this idea called procedural justice right now. Um, which is a body that gives us some very good clues about what the public is looking for 
um, when they are communicating with the courts, whether it's in person or whether it's through the actual walls or the built environment. And so that idea of procedural justice guided the work in this project and others and is really the foundation for this. So, um, so we're going to start out with a little Q&A, so I'm yes. going to pass it to Lisa to ask our first opening question. Okay. Um, and good morning. I don't know if you came to these uh, yesterday. Procedural justice, they showed the courtroom, uh, the courthouse where the signs were convoluted and kind of old. Embarrassed to say that was our courthouse, Manhattan Criminal Court. So first thing is, how do we know if we're doing a good job? And what might the public consider when assessing whether we're doing a good job? How do we know we're doing a good job? Does anyone have any idea what would be a feedback that you know you're doing a good job signage-wise? And feel free to shout yes. it out, too, and we well, can well, always repeat mm -hmm. if you're not near a microphone. Yes. Well, people don't look uh, confused about where they're going if Thanks. you actually make eye contact with them, which Thanks. I try to do, and I ask them where they're going if they can tell you through after the confusion of going through weapons screening, that they actually remember which floor of a 24-story courthouse <laughs> they're going to. Exactly, exactly. What else? What you are some other ways we know whether we're doing a good job? Are they getting to their hearings on time? Are there a whole lot of no-shows that are actually <laughs> not no-shows, they're just uh, wandering around the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So are they wandering? Are they going, anyone else before we go on? Are they wandering? Do they have clear, okay. Are they asking you questions in front of your current signage? Exactly, that's a big, that, that's absolutely a big, 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 because that tells you what, your signage is not working. Exactly. Um, I can give you a really quick story um, about signage that I had. I, in 2015, I sold a property. 2018, I, re I didn't know that I owed a lien. I, owed, I had a lien because uh, I went to use my debit card at a Walmart, found out the account was frozen. No big deal. Thank God for the secret money, right? So um, upon calling the bank, I have received the information that the account was frozen, contact the city, et cetera. I was given very specific instructions. Go to 66 John Street, go to the second floor, and I had to pay the balance of the money because they took the money, I had to pay the balance of the money due. No big deal, great instructions, right? I know what to do. I arrived at the building at 8.15, they open at 8.30. I, there's a office security person there, I stand online, and now the security person is now doing security duties where they are now uh, checking people in, et cetera, et cetera. So now the queue, the line that I'm standing in, becomes the information line. There's no signage. Not a good thing, because what does the line do? We give out wrong information. Stand online. Stand online. But for the other floors, you did not have to stand online. You were able to go straight up. Long story short, uh, 8.30, the line opens. I go up, I don't go to the information desk. There is no signage there because I'm armed with the information that I need. Um, go to the second floor, window number 11. Proceed to the window. There's no one there. Why not? You were supposed to go to the information window first and receive a ticket and then proceed. So this is how important signage is as we're moving throughout. So if your signage is not giving clear direction, you need to revisit what's you, what are your walls saying. That's if walls could speak, if walls could talk, it's clear, concise information for users to navigate our facilities. Thank you. So, so we've thought a little bit about how we might assess whether we're doing a good job in this space, but how might the answers change if we think about how the public yes. assesses whether we're doing a good job? What are they looking for? Or what are some cues to them that we are good at our jobs? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Does it look professional? Does it look professional? And what are some examples of professionalism that might be visible? Consistent, same feel and look and feel, mm -hmm. yeah. as opposed to paper yeah. taped to all the walls 
or brown signage next to a red sign, next to a yellow sign, yes. next to, or 20 different signs for 20 different things Absolutely. over signage. Yeah, I mean, so you're already on the, the, the signage track, right? Yes. That's the purpose of, of today's talk. And so all the energy we're pouring into being professional, sometimes this, the signs and the paper and the junk um, in our physical space is maybe sending a different message. Mm -hmm. Yes, was there another comment in the back? Are they in plain language? Is it right. something I can really understand, or is mm -hmm. it, or if I don't read or speak English, is right. there a way for me to figure out how to get where I need to be? Absolutely, mm -hmm. right, it's in plain language. I can't tell you how many times when we've talked with different jurisdictions about signage, and they say, oh, the signs don't matter. People, people don't even read them, right? It's kind of the comment about you can be standing right in front of the sign, and no someone's see. asking a question. And so maybe it's that people don't read the signs, or maybe they're trying to read the sign, and it's just not communicating what we think it is, right? Because of the, the words we're choosing, or even just sort of the, the kind of format, the things that a graphic designer would immediately be horrified by, right? Um, but there wasn't a graphic designer that created the sign. It was a, it was a clerk, right, mm -hmm. who, who has other gifts and skills. Is it direct or is it polite? You must That's do this as opposed to please do this. Yeah, so it word can. choice. Does it feel like an inviting um, and respectful message or is it something that is um, more accusational or rude? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of the, um, just as I was kind of brainstorming some of the things that we thought maybe you would say, um, so maybe there are some sort of notions of justice, right? Maybe people have some kind of um, broad uh, conceptual sense of what it means for justice professionals and um, kind of the inherent legitimacy of the criminal justice system. Maybe they have an image of what the, the uh, judiciary is like and that helps them form opinions about um, whether or not you're doing a good job is kind of the interactions with specific court professionals. Social media. Um, Yelp reviews. Mm, Has anyone yes. ever looked at the Yelp reviews for your courthouse? Mm -hmm. I encourage you to do that. It's fascinating, right? And, and you can comment. discount them yes. as, as anomalies, um, but they're still valuable feedback, right? Even the grumpy people who take the time um, maybe to give you a negative review, but I bet there will be some good ones in there too. But again, these are all ways that people are forming opinions about the work we're doing. You know, whether deserved or not, um, this is our reality. And so the other thing, um, which again is just sort of the, the key focus of our presentation today, is that the actual courthouse itself or the physical environment is another way that we're messaging to the public, usually pretty accidentally, um, about, about the commitment we've made to the public. <clears throat> oh, in, in terms of first impressions, the first impression is weapon screening. Yes. And part of that impression is a special line for lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all the, immediately, as an ordinary Joe, uh, I'm second-class citizen, and this is not designed for me. So my expectations are pretty low. Yeah. And it's a great example Thank because... You. So many of the things, the examples I'm sure that'll come to mind for you, we know the good reasons behind policies like that, right? The core professionals coming and going all day, every day, we feel that a, an expedited process is justified, and, it, and that may very well be the correct answer, but it's so smart to think about, well, what is the perception to the public about that, and are there ways, maybe it's to change the policy, or maybe it's to message it differently, or, or think about, um, yeah, what, what that is communicating. I also, just as an aside, because you brought it up, so yes. in the whole course of this project I worked on with Lisa, so there's a way I could have requested a pass, a secure pass, it's called, right. to just so whiz right through divided. security. But man, I, I, every day I had to show up for a 9.30 meeting or something in mm -hmm. this courthouse and wait in a line around the block in the rain, sleet, snow, whatever, and, but I did it because it was so critical to remind me what the project was about. What is the experience of our public that are coming through our courthouses? So just as an aside, 
even though I'm sure your court um, security personnel know you, wait in the line one day. Like pick the peak period, wait mm -hmm. in the line, try to experience it, or go to a neighboring court um, where maybe they don't know you and, and experience it. It's a good reminder of, of that first impression. That, that was great. That was one of our challenges, which you'll see will come up. So this is the public opinion. They say they greet you cordially, say hi, good afternoon with a non-threatening tone, explain the process or what my rights are. If I ask a question, answer it. So the public felt that we did not listen. As people are speaking, we had a tendency, we use a certificate of disposition without listening to the entire, go to room 150, go to our central clerk's office. We were not listening to the person speak. We were not giving entire answers. We were giving cryptic answers. We were using our language, which is not the same language for a layperson. You need a CD, you had an ACD, you need to go have a COR. They didn't understand any of that language. So sometimes you have to be very mindful of how you speak, the tone that you speak, what you say, and good morning, good afternoon. It, oh, it's always helpful, and also remember to use their name. Not too personal, but you call them by name. Eye contact was very important. It's uh, one of the things that our officers tend to do, and this was in their training. There are no cell phones in the courtroom. The cell phone inadvertently goes off. No cell phones in the courtroom! You know, that's, <laughs> that was totally inappropriate. You lost the person because you forget to turn them off. We're all human, we forget to turn them off. So it, it, we had to tone things down. And these are things that we were not aware of. You knew they were going on, but we weren't aware of until CCI came in and brought them to our attention. Because you're so busy administrating justice that you don't look at things that are very simple that you can fix that would give you a better response from the public, so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of you may have attended a session yesterday yes. um, that my colleague Robin Mazur presented. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice some of the images um, are overlapping. These are uh, images we've collected. Many of these photos I took myself, courthouses across the country. I really do believe that every courthouse pretty much has images like this. So no one is immune. Go home, find yours, mm -hmm. take a picture. You can send it to me. I'll include it in my, uh, my hall of fame here. Um, but the images of our courthouses, um, some of them are completely beyond our control, right? What, what kind of images or um, emotions does this maybe trigger in the average member of the public, this image of this courthouse? Anything? Does it feel welcoming? So, yes. Looks like a prison? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, it's imposing. Mm -hmm. Very imposing, mm -hmm. right? And that was deliberate when it was built, right? The sense of, right, the judge up on high and the big strong yes. columns, right? It was, it was kind of manufacturing legitimacy. And so what this topic teaches us, though, is that there are other ways to signal that trust building that we want. Um, and that we might have to counteract a little bit some of that imposing, um, that imposing imagery that we're sending. Um, handwritten signs, mm. I know one of you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. Rules, every courthouse has yes. lots of rules. Um, some of them good, some of them a little bit obscure, mm -hmm. and you realize there may be just some particular <laughs> judge or particular <laughs> administrator who has, um, Different. you know, it, but, but again, the, it's not that the rule is bad, but thinking about how we message it is important. Don't. Or it's ridiculous. Are you sending you me home to change my shoes? Right. So having a rule with no slippers, no, you know, bare feet in sandals, what, what message are we sending to the public, right? Do we want them to go home? Or are we welcoming of a public that, mm -hmm. right, again, and, and that may be a very appropriate rule in some places, but how can it be conveyed differently so that it's respectful? Yeah. I just think one of the things that we have to think about is, it, speaking of rules, um, really how many sets of rules you get when you come into a courthouse. I mean, there's a rule at the door. The rules are also issued by the law enforcement folks at the door mm -hmm. who are letting you in. 
Um, typically, there are rules right after that security checkpoint to tell mm -hmm. you what you can and cannot do. There are rules on the door of the courtroom. Yeah. Um, and then the judge tells you <laughs> what I the guess. rules are in the courtroom. <laughs> and then as you're, as you're exiting, we tell you what the rules are mm -hmm. again. And so I think the, the interesting thing about that is that they all are usually conflicting, meaning that the law enforcement officers will give you one set of rules, the judges prefer another set of rules, the clerk's office has another set of rules, and then by the time people really navigate the system, they're just confused. So I don't know if the signage is, you know, necessarily all of the issue. Sometimes it's the communication with folks within the, the, the courthouse as well. That's a great point. I mean, and I will say that um, one of the lessons we learned from this project, which we'll talk more about in a minute, is that the planning process that is required to make good signs makes people get on the same page about what the rule mm -hmm. is. And we found some inconsistencies, mm -hmm. right? Where you ask one group and they tell you the rule is A and B, and you now ask another group of, of experts in the building and they tell you the rule is B and C. So, of course, the public is, you know, if they're paying attention, they're confused. And if they're not paying attention, of course, they're confused also, so mm -hmm. absolutely. So some of it is the, the process which again, we're gonna to get to in a second, um, is almost its own product. Yeah, yes. Um, during our uh, session on ADA yesterday, the topic of Braille signage came up and whether or not it's effective and helpful mm. for the blind. Um, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, um, so I'm not an accessibility expert, far from it. We did work with a communications expert in our early uh, work on this topic. Um, and that, you know, thinking about accessibility as an important overlay to this is key. Um, in the, the graphic design firm that mm -hmm. we did hire to work on this project also, they, they now come with their own expertise knowing about code requirements and other kind of best practices about you know, height placement and, and all of that. So it's definitely is, is part of the discussion, but I think that's, that's where our expertise yes. ends, but mm -hmm. I think it could be interesting to follow up on that and see um, where others have maybe tried interesting things in that arena. Mm -hmm. So I wanna keep moving along yes. just so we can get to the, mm -hmm. the good stuff. Lots yes. of examples of messy, chaotic, confusing definitely. signs. This is one of my favorite, mm -hmm. but really this is everywhere, mm -hmm. right? It's laugh worthy, but it, it, it also is everywhere. So. Um, okay, so, so we're not graphic designers. Um, we can't tell you what the kind of best practices of signage are from that perspective, mm -hmm. but we can tell you the theory that was motivating our project, which I said earlier is this idea called procedural justice. It's rooted in psychology research, where a bunch of academics set out to better understand why people comply with government, basically. Um, and it turns out that people who are compliant with courts or government have some similar things in common. And in particular, they believe that they experienced these four common elements. And so these are the four things. This became our framework for what we were trying to have the signage achieve. As a side note, we also, of course, want all of our interpersonal communication to have these things too, but that's another presentation. Okay, so the four things we wanted the walls to communicate. Respect, clear rules and procedures, neutral decision making, and that's a kind of a nuanced mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. um, and voice. So thinking about ways to invite or have people feel like they are heard or have an opportunity to be heard. So these we talk about as the elements of procedural justice and those, that was sort of our little checklist at every point, how could we dr be driving forward each of those? Now, it's tempting to just want to focus on the top two, because I think it's, it's an obvious way that many mm -hmm. existing signs fail. And so um, where we really pushed ourselves was, I think, on the latter two. Mm -hmm. What are ways that we can really demonstrate that um, the decisions are made neutrally without bias, right? We're not biasing people of different income levels, different ethnicities, different languages that they speak, et cetera. Um, and inviting people to be heard in a process that rarely slows down and really does have time to hear people's side of the story. Okay, so just our quick working definition of procedural justice, it's about the, the court procedures themselves, and that's contrasted um, by court outcomes, right? So an outcome might be 
pleading guilty and paying a fine, right? Or in a civil case, you win your case or you lose your case. Those are outcomes. Uh, procedural justice, on the other hand, is about how you felt you were treated in that process. And those four elements, did you experience those four elements? And what I love about this topic in talking with folks like you all is that I think it can be very frustrating to work in a system where very few court users love the outcome that they walk out of the building with, right? The, the process is draining. Many people, especially in a criminal court mm -hmm. context, are walking out with something short of just a, you know, a straight forward win, mm -hmm. right? There, there are lots of kind of bad outcomes that people are having to process. And that is largely beyond our control um, as court administrators and the like. So, but we can affect the actual procedure that they're experiencing and that treatment that they feel like they're experiencing. And that ends up being more influential, which is a win, right? So we have control over the thing that is more influential of whether or not they think we're doing a good job. Okay, I think this is my last research yes. slide. Mm -hmm. um, it's just to highlight how much more influential that fair treatment feeling seems to be than bad outcomes. It's, it's not a subtle difference. Lots and lots of studies have shown this dynamic that the, the green bar or procedural fairness, how they felt that they were treated, actually is far more influential in whether or not they end up complying with what the court is asking them. And that may be, that may be very intuitive to you or it may feel very different than, um, than your instincts. Um, but the research has been fairly consistent over time and is continually kind of tinkered with um, as, as the system and researchers explore how can we really double down on this idea of substantive fairness and improving perceptions of fairness. Okay, I'm gonna turn it to Lisa. Okay. So, so our legitimacy is not assumed by many who come before us. Trust must be earned in each encounter. So again, I didn't think about our legitimacy. So like, let's just get our jobs done. But it is important. So some of the things we've done, one of the things we did was the front entrance. As soon as you come in, there's an office, and there was nothing out there. There was just a long line, a queue, and again, that queue becomes your information. What we did, we have an officer posted outside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you'll expect going forward. This line is for you to check in. You will see attorneys going in or employees there. There's two entrances. There's an entrance here. There's also another entrance down the hall you may use, but there was no interaction, so we had the interaction outside. As far as the conflicting information, what we also had, we had the court officer giving the announcement of what to expect in the courtroom. Silence, you know, your case is not being called, your attorney is not here once your attorney arrives. The judge also said the same thing, ladies and gentlemen, if your case is not called, and then we had the court clerk saying the same thing. So that was consistency, and that gave credibility to our process. So it, that also helped in that way. Um, when we also look at our trust, we were transparent in what we, um, how we interacted with our public. You have a question, you need to know something, we gave them full, complete answers, although it may not be what they wanted to hear. But again, giving those things out, it helped um, with our public. Um, and other than that, it was just that we just, it was just important to earn the trust of our public that, whereas we didn't give account to that information before. But those doing those things actually made us have more credibility with the public. So as small changes, and we'll talk about the signage as we come up, we made small changes. These are not huge changes. Consistency in the sign, the features of the sign, the way it looks it all gave more credibility and it gave respect to our users. So they felt that we heard them, they felt that they had a voice, and they felt that we respected them. So it helped us a lot. So you can tell yes. that Lisa has mm -hmm. this just coursing through mm -hmm. her blood naturally. Mm -hmm. we, we started with that yes. as the baseline. Yes. Um, but just to, to frame it for you all, yes. so this was a couple years now, the Mayor's mm -hmm. Office of Criminal Justice just of New here. York City um, we got them excited about this idea yes, of seeing if we could sort of transform, mm -hmm. um, at least in modest ways, one of the criminal courthouses in, 
in the city. And we were thinking like, maybe we'll start with, you know, maybe we'll start in the Bronx or maybe we'll go to Queens, maybe one of the slightly less high profile um, courthouses if there is a thing in our city. Um, but to their credit, the, the court system leadership and the mayor's office said, let's do this in Manhattan. Because if you can prove that it can work in Manhattan, which is a very, very busy courthouse, yes. then you're good. And so we mm -hmm. took a big uh, gulp and we said, OK. And so we set out to test two main things. Um, one is whether these kind of modest environmental changes can make a difference. Uh, do court users notice the improvements? Mm -hmm. Do those changes feel more respectful, promote understanding, uh, noting those elements of procedural justice? And then does that actually make it an impact or have an impact on a sense of legitimacy? Um, the second component, which we're not going to talk about today, but mm -hmm. it's equally fascinating, is we yes. actually did some training and workshopping with some of the judges and other court staff there, too, as an isolated measure to see whether some kind of behavioral changes also um, had an impact. But we, were, the study actually did tease out kind of signage alone mm -hmm. uh, impact, and so that. that's the focus of today. Mm -hmm. So I want Lisa to give us yes. good context, so of what is right. the context that we were working in? So as you can see, our building is pretty old. 1938, <laughs> the building was constructed. Um, so as of 2018, we had 1.2 million people come through the front door. That's employees, uh, other agencies that we share the building with. That's a lot, that's almost 3,000 per day. Besides that, we have at least 60,000 online arrests and DATs, that's desk appearance tickets. So those are people, the arrests are coming through the back door. Those aren't even accounted for. So we share our building with at least 12 other agencies. We have NYPD, we have Department of Corrections, we have probation, we have cases, CJA, we have the sex offender registry where you have to register if you're a sex offender. We have uh, the D district attorney's office, of course, and we have health providers as well, and we have the attorneys in there as well. So it's quite a few biz people, and it's very busy. So you can only imagine going in and out that it's, it could be confusing. We also share our building with Supreme Court. We have the first five, five floors, uh, at 10 and up. It belongs to Supreme Court. So it's constantly busy. We operate seven days a week, day and night. On the weekends, we're doing arraignments as well as we're doing emergency family orders of protections. We're also doing what we call juvenile court on the weekends. Every weekend for all five boroughs, Manhattan is the only borough that will do juvenile cases because at one point, the children weren't being heard. Their cases, they were arrested on Friday, and they weren't heard until Monday. So to avoid that, Manhattan Criminal Court is the only court that will do juvenile petitions on the weekend. So just the idea, we are constantly busy seven days a week, holidays, there's no time off. So that's just to give you an idea how busy the building is and how many people are going in and out. So. So understandably, mm -hmm. the court hadn't spent a whole mm -hmm. lot of time or resources on the kind of question of challenges of, of signage mm -hmm. because they were busy sorting mm -hmm. out all of those other um, real mm -hmm. substantive mm -hmm. matters. Uh, but it was great that they did step up and say, all right, well, we admit there's a problem, but what, you know, what is the extent of the problem? What do various people think about this problem? And then how are we going to fix it? So, so we had a very lengthy design process. Uh, we hired a design firm. We hired architects. We hired lighting consultants, mm -hmm. uh, an acoustics so, consultant, yes. which taught us mm -hmm. fascinating things about how the, the courtrooms themselves mm -hmm. actually were kind of working against us, mm -hmm. right, in, in people being heard, both the litigants appearing before the judge and people in the, the audience. audience. Um, so we had lots and lots of experts. Uh, that certainly included Lisa and her mm -hmm. team. That included the judiciary. It included court users. Um, it included, uh, you know, all of these consultants that we hired. So we wanted to hear what everybody had to say about both the problem and then help to generate ideas about how we might fix them. And if you were in the morning plenary, um, the, the reference to creatives, mm -hmm. right, where you start with this, like, no bad answer, yes. no wrong answer kind of process, we did that. 
Um, and we came up with lots of outlandish, expensive things that we could yes. never implement uh, in, in any courthouse, probably. Mm -hmm. But it was a helpful process to really think, think broadly about what we could maybe achieve. Uh, and then winnow it down to something that you know, was within budget and time frame and all of that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but the process was really key because not only were we generating lots of good ideas from the right people, but we were, of course, also getting their buy-in for when we ultimately were going to hang up new, uh, new signs in their space that they work all day, every day. So there were lots of challenges flagged um, that I think Lisa's yes. going to run through yes. a few. So this is um, the main one that you speak of, the first entrance when you come in. Um, we were not surprised that when the feedback came back, the long wait in line, and there was uh, no direction as to what should they do. Why are we waiting so long? So that was our first initial complaint that we had to um, address also. But remember, they're standing outside in the cold, in the rain. We do try to open the doors early, but everyone must go through security. So we try to do it more expeditiously now, and with the announcement, at least you understand why. Um, some of the other um, complaints that we had um, in the courtrooms where they could not hear, that was one of the things that we had to address also. We had a, it's a group called Court Watchers that they'll come and they'll listen in the courtroom. And I'm not saying anything, some of them were older, but we had to now give them, we had to change our mics, but prior to changing our mics, because they projected better, we had to give them hearing devices. So we normally, that's something we didn't do in the past, but we had to change our operation. We now give out hearing devices, take out, take a ID, and then they return them at the end of their watch, because they're reporting, they're the ones that are reporting on these social medias. Um, some of the other, if we had our officers, again, um, not talking to the people, but talking at the people, that was really horrible because they felt, again, that they had no voice, that they were not being listened. It's much better if I am speaking to you, Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, it's much better. Will you please not turn your phone, your cell phone, can you please step outside? We had to change the yelling process. So there were many, yes, we had to, there were many challenges and our staff was not easily persuaded, although we had a focus group and everyone, but initial change is difficult. You now have to make an announcement, but I will tell you, after they made the changes, they were very happy. It eliminated questions that were redundant it, re it eliminated uh, people having to come up. They knew they had instructions. The courtroom ran much easier. So if someone's phone is on, they stepped out. They understood, my attorney's not here. I know I must go out and call. So we did have challenges with, as with any change goes, but it was well worth it. That's what I will say. And the signage that we changed, which you will see as it comes up, it was, it was well worth it. And the feedback was absolutely phenomenal, I can tell you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you may have noted a mix of challenges. So some that you all flagged in the very beginning, right? So misinformation, mm -hmm. yes. um, you know, clutter, things mm -hmm. like that, which in, in a certain way are fairly superficial. Mm -hmm. um, but the other base, part of the baseline research were some very like core things about mm -hmm. confidence in mm -hmm. the justice system mm -hmm. across the board. Um, and so just to give you a little snapshot of that, so um, we asked at different stages of the process, meaning before we implemented mm -hmm. any changes and after, kind of what is the confidence level in the, the various components of the system? Uh, and you'll notice they're not great, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, thankfully, I think the court employees are among the higher. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe not surprisingly, lesson. jails are at the low end of that. Um, and so the, the one bit of good news that I choose to take from this, though, is that one bit of frustration we hear from various uh, justice system professionals is, gosh, I don't have control over the entire system, right? I can't control what the police are doing or, right, these prior touch points that may contribute to people's trust and confidence. But this suggests that, that individuals coming through our system are forming unique opinions about each of those touch points. And that's good news to all of us because that means that we can at least control what they think about us, 
right? Whether we are the court employees or we are the judges or we are running the jails, right? It's not, this is not a flat bar across the top where mm -hmm. everybody kind of averaged out. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's good news. The other good news from just a research standpoint, you always want a low baseline, right? You want numbers to be able to improve. So we're going to get yes. to that. Um, and I do think we have to pick up our pace okay. a little bit, Lisa. So okay. Can... This is just like really quick. And you can see the signage before convoluted. And some of our signage is OCA approved. That's Office of Court Administration that run the courts. They're OCA approved, but it's horrible. There are blank signs there. There are handmade signs there. This was changed to that, much pleasing to the eye easy to read, it gives you directions where to go. So, so step one mm -hmm. of our process, mm -hmm. once it was time to implement, mm -hmm. is we took every sign off the walls. Yes. Um, and again, I give Lisa a lot of credit because mm -hmm. I can only imagine mm -hmm. how stressful that mm -hmm. was, especially for a courthouse that never closes, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like there was like some down hours that we could do this, but we took every sign off the walls and then tried to think really deliberately about the information that needed to be where and how it was presented. Um, we've talked a lot about security. Um, this is a great example mm -hmm. of something where um, court leadership thought that the security procedures were one thing, mm -hmm. and the security staff themselves were messaging something slightly different. And we advocated that the signs should reflect what the officers are actually saying, because otherwise you have this inconsistency that's really disrespectful, not to mention confusing to the public. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even just something as subtle as uh, remove everything from your pockets. Apparently, the actual procedure is not exactly that, but that's what the officers say. So we mm -hmm. said the sign should say mm -hmm. that. Um, messaging in two languages whenever possible. Um, Spanish is the second most commonly spoken so language yes. in, in New York, but mm -hmm. also giving visuals sure. when we can. You know, it's hard to, to use graphics to convey, con you know, very complicated information, but we try to do it whenever possible. And our arraignment office. Um, arraignment is a very, it's our, at the first point of contact, as you know. So before this is our information, arraignment. You had no idea when the office was open, what to expect. This gives you a better idea. When you come into the office, do you have the name? Do you have the arrest number? Do you have any information that's going to help you? It tells you the hour of the operation. And it's in English, it's in Spanish, it tells you the room number much different before than after, and it's much cleaner and neater to the eye to look at. This was very funny because this is our cashier's office before. As you can see, it does have signs posted, which is really nice, but once the gate closes, no one knew what it said. So you didn't know what office it was. This is afterwards. We have the cashier sign up. The hours are posted. And if you cannot go there, there's an office, the arraignment office you will go to, and that, that will serve as our cashier's office now. But it, for us, we thought we were saying, this is really great. You have signs there. But it wasn't. So there are things that can be done that you think are good, that it's a second eye is always good to have, OK? So. Um, calendars, posting mm -hmm. the day's calendar. Who mm -hmm. loves the way your court the posts the day's calendar? Like, who's, whose yeah. case is posted yes, when? All right, so mm -hmm. there's a good showing. And yes. raise your hand if you really don't like the way mm. your calendar mm -hmm. system. Okay, maybe equally as many. So mm -hmm. it was a challenge here. There's, it's, it's something kind of one step more modern than like a dot matrix printout that, that works very well for the New York courts in, in many ways, and we knew that it would be sort of a non-starter to change that system as part of this process, but we did want to see if we could kind of build some context around it to at least make it easier to interpret. Um, and so before, they were posted in these kind of glass. reflective glass mm -hmm. containers that were a little hard to read mm -hmm. um, and didn't have great, or didn't have any instructions about how to read it, mm -hmm. and so putting some instructions next to it, hoping that that would improve the process. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, outside of each courtroom door, so right, so it was information in the lobby, information next to each courtroom, orienting same. people to not only how to check to see that their, that their name was on the right list, but also starting to give them a heads up to the rules signs that they were then going to see again in the courtroom. So, so I think Lisa mentioned uh, this maybe. So, there's a very, and, and I know one of our audience members mm -hmm. already flagged this. So it is unavoidable in, in this context to have security be a very visible presence in mm -hmm. the lobby of the courtroom. 
but we wanted to think about how we could actually, so we provided some information about security screening, so that was one component, mm -hmm. but we also wanted to see how we could turn that into a positive uh, from a procedural justice standpoint. And so in the middle of the lobby, there's this big round yes. desk where one of the senior court officers would stand. And I think before the project, he would have said that his main function there was security. Mm -hmm. And he would check in kind of um, uh, unauthorized or prohibited things, like right. if someone accidentally came in with a mm -hmm. pocket knife or something, mm -hmm. you could check it and get it back after the end. Um, but we did something really sneaky, which was we relabeled that <laughs> desk information. Because what of course happened naturally, with the label or not, is that people would come up and ask that person, right, as the only person mm -hmm. in the middle of the lobby, ask that person questions. And he was great at providing yes. information. So we just sort of put a label to something that was happening already and hoped that that would convey, um, you know, just both clear information about what we wanted people to do, but also as a way of getting at that voice component, right? We are signaling to people, we want to help you. We mm -hmm. want to answer your questions yes. and putting a big sign to that effect. This is our central clerk's office. Um, you can, I don't know if you can see that, prior to it being changed with the sign where you read um, before the, it was hospital green. Does anyone remember hospital pale green? <laughs> no, yeah, so it had, it was horrible. So that also reflected on the workers. So now we have, it's a glossy green, it's two-tone with wallpaper, and then we have our sign here before the person gets to the window. It gives them something to read, it gives them the instructions prior to coming to the window, and this is just for information. But also now the employees, they took on a more professional stance because as they're approaching, they have the information that they need. You don't have to go, oh, what do you want? Even though you shouldn't, but they felt better about the office as well. So the signage not only helped the users, it also helped the employees. Okay, so maybe everything up until this point has been kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. So here's where we get really cutting edge, mm -hmm. um, at least yes. for the context in which yes. we all work. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to turn the waiting mm -hmm. problem, the long wait problem into an upside or make that waiting period constructive. Um, and so we paired that with the challenge that people don't have enough information or aren't messaged kind of proactively about the actual courtroom process. You know, who's who in the courtroom, mm -hmm. what can they expect in terms of, you know, court costs if they decide to, um, if they decide to plead guilty that mm -hmm. day, whatever it w may be. And so we turned that into uh, a challenge of how can we literally put information in people's hands or in front of their eyes to potentially read during that period. Uh, one of the experts we worked with went so far as to say that we basically had like a sensory deprivation uh, situation beforehand. You can't have any phones, no, no newspapers, newspapers, and you're sitting in a room like this with nothing on the walls yes. for hours. Mm -hmm. so, so how can we give people some things to look at? So we considered handouts, we were worried about kind of litter, um, and so we came up with the idea of making signs that got gl super glued right on the backs of the benches. Yes. Uh, you can imagine all the potential criticism, mm -hmm. um, and despite some, what do you call it, Lisa, the art, the artistry that has, some That's, people have yes. kind of scratched Good them scratch up. Or, or, the scratch scratch mm -hmm. But for the most part, mm -hmm. they've endured pretty well, <laughs> and you have this now yes. kind of quasi-permanent information that's right there in yes. the courtroom about um, basic rights, right? We mm -hmm. wanted to communicate things like your right to a lawyer, um, conveying, again, who's who in the courtroom mm -hmm. so that you understand who the key players mm -hmm. are. We also, as I mentioned, wanted to, to really stress, um, you know, uh, respect for people's mm -hmm. rights, neutrality. Um, this was a very controversial addition mm -hmm. to the signage package, but actually putting up a sign about defendants' rights mm -hmm. right in the lobby. Um, I haven't been in any courthouses that have, have done that. Maybe you all have experimented with it already. Um, but really um, messaging constitutional rights to the people who are there. Because one of the things we found at baseline is that it's really easy for people to feel treated as if they're guilty mm -hmm. right at arraignments. Mm -hmm. Right? We're just, we're marching you along towards your guilty plea, was the feeling. So how can we counter that? 
Um, hopefully we're countering it in our interpersonal communication, but we wanted the walls to also provide that. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, this is maybe is our last but yes. not least. Yes. Um, but mm -hmm. we also wanted to think about how, again, right, you talk with, we talked with all these stakeholders like yes. Lisa, why do you do this job, right? It's like our morning plenary. And they had these very um, kind of ambitious and, and notable uh, reasons that they get up and they do this work. But it was sometimes hard to feel that in the courtroom. And so we wanted to convey kind of a sense of purpose and mission. And so we proposed putting a mission statement in massive font yes. on the courtroom the walls. walls and then kind of a, kind of a pro-justice type mm -hmm. quote. Uh, from someone who was a person of color mm -hmm. was important to us, mm -hmm. right? Someone who represented and who could get at that neutrality piece mm -hmm. as well. Uh, this, this definitely was met with some opposition. Mm -hmm. There were concerns about was this consistent with court decorum mm -hmm. to have something, um, you know, so significant and large on the walls. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the court leadership said, uh, well, we'll have to get our legal team to review the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the mission you came up with. And I said, oh, don't worry. We took that off it's your yours. website. And they said, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, then I guess it's good, right? Mm -hmm. So you probably have some content that someone has already developed that would be great, thinking mm -hmm. about other ways that you can put that up in the lobby, in the courtrooms, et cetera. OK, so I do want to, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to get to the punchline. Mm -hmm. Um, the purpose of this is that studying things in courthouses is hard. Uh, follow up with me later if you want more on that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the punchline, though, is does the public notice better signs? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So um, the left column is before, the right column is after. Uh, did they see signs inside the courtroom before? 20% said yes. Afterwards, 72%. Right, so even though it's sort of just in the ether, we notice people sitting, waiting for their court case to be heard, looking up at the massive quote on the mm -hmm. wall. Right, so the, the message was being received. Um, signs in the courtroom were written in a respectful way. 62% said yes before, 93%. So almost everybody felt like they were receiving a respectful message from the court. And to me, that's just, that's just shocking, mm -hmm. I think. Um, Really powerful stuff. So the you know, gazillion dollar question is, do all these signs actually change um, public trust and confidence in the justice system? Maybe. Uh, is, is the not surprising and uh, not surprising punchline to this. So we did notice some improvements, uh, most specifically with the um, judges who we worked very closely with to try to do some behavioral mm -hmm. changes as mm -hmm. well. So where there was a deeper investment in this idea, this is my takeaway, where there was the deepest investment in behavioral changes and environmental changes, the public did start to notice. And you can start to undo those very low levels of perception that they started with, right? The 33%, the 40% confidence. Um, we can actually start to get those numbers to, rate, to go up with, with not that much of a kind of sea change in, in how we're administering justice. Okay, so in our lab, it's definitely going okay. in the right way. Yes. So and we want to hear from you. Go ahead, Yes, Lisa. and this is our community court, and community courts are generally, they're not courthouses. They were either schools, theaters, and stuff. These are some of the ideas that we use in uh, changing those courts, making them pleasing to the eye and easy to use. And um, the last thing I want to say, if you think that people are not reading the signs, they are. Our signs that say no eating, no cell phones, no whatever. We had a gentleman sleeping in the courtroom. The officer went to wake him. He said, but your sign says it doesn't say no sleeping. <laughs> they are reading the signs. So just keep that in mind that they are being noticed and they are using them, though. But this is what we've done with our other courthouses. And it, it works fantastic. And the officers are great, so. So our last yes, couple of yes. minutes, we did just want to hear any mm -hmm. final thoughts from you all about, I think the fact that you're here probably means you've already thought about this and mm -hmm. have maybe tried to uh, make some changes in your courthouses. Um, and so send us pictures later, but yes. any, any feedback or advice to your colleagues about how to get started in this area? Who's done some work in this space of making mm -hmm. signage improvements? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 
uh, long lines is something that we have created ourselves by the way we schedule our calendars. If we set everything for 8.30 or 9 in the morning mm -hmm. and everybody, there are very long lines, who is to blame? It is us. So if we segment our calendars and have a tenth of the people come at 8.30 and then another tenth at 9, 9.30, 10, there will not be long lines. Duh. It's a great observation, a good, right? Yes. Imagine going to a store, and when you get to the store, there's a line out the door. Would you stop, or would you maybe choose a different store, mm -hmm. right? Now here, we're the only store in town, so I guess people have to either to come here or fail to appear, right? Or, mm -hmm. or make some other kind of value judgment about, about us. But I think it's a great comment. It's thinking about the actual procedures that, can in, that co create this problem we now have to solve. Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Question. So, so um, congratulations on yeah. all of the work that you've done. It, it really Thank looks you. great. We are embarking on this process um, in our court. We, um, I'm in Atlanta in Fulton okay. County, so we have a really huge court. Yes. Um, we have tried to implement more of a technical um, wayfinding and signage opportunities as opposed to the um, the printed signage mm -hmm. because um, you know judges come and go clerk changes it's just very difficult to keep up with all the changes plus we want to keep people from sticking the paper everywhere mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no owner of the paper mm -hmm. um, and so we've tried the digital approach we're um, working on implementing that it should start later this year we're really excited about it I think it will be overwhelming for folks um, but I think it will definitely give a different appeal to the, the space. The one thing I did want to ask about, um, get your thoughts on, is we're working with an architectural firm that really drafted our, our plan as well. Um, and part of what they've asked us to do is to have the buildings col color coded. We have three different buildings that connect. Um, we thought that that was a really great idea. If you're in the red building, you're here for one thing. If you're in the green building, you're there for another thing. Um, until we realized that people are colorblind. Mm. And um, then that became an issue. So I just want your take on using, um, you know, some non-traditional strategies like color and things of that nature to help people identify where they are. And if that's a good approach or is there a perfect approach? I think that's so interesting. I'm, we, we thought a lot about kind of branding. So mm -hmm. even... So I guess there were two levels of that challenge yes. in Lisa's courthouse. So one, as Lisa mentioned, there are lots of reasons you might be coming to 100 Center Street, which is right. the criminal courthouse. Um, you might be going to visit some other city agency. Mm -hmm. You might be going to Supreme Court. So we couldn't just message to the criminal court users, right? We had to message to everybody. Um, the other challenge is that right across the street and right down the block are other courthouses. courthouses. So lots of times mm -hmm. people will kind of get off of the subway and look around and they'll see a courthouse mm -hmm. that has a center street address and they'll go to it, wait in this massive line, only mm -hmm. to get inside and realize they're in the wrong building. Mm -hmm. so, so given that, one of the things that we wrestled with and ultimately landed on is sort of branding the address 100 Center Street. And I'll mm -hmm. see if I can quickly um, get to a, a mm -hmm. copy of that um, in a second. Um, but 100th Street kind of became this logo that we tried to use on all of the external and mm -hmm. internal signage mm -hmm. to message that 100. basically the address is the name of the building mm -hmm. as opposed to criminal court or mm -hmm. what have you. Um, because you're really, probably for the average user, it's either right or it's not. So like if you're in the red building, you might not know that you yeah, should be in a green mm -hmm. building, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're gonna like redo mm -hmm. all your forms and mm -hmm. like the form is green, you know, yeah. the ticket is green and mm -hmm. the whatever. So, so we wrestled with that challenge as well and decided to actually brand the address. Mm -hmm. uh, we did talk with another wayfinding expert that also advised doing some kind of pathways, Footprint, right? Yeah. So Footprint. there might be like a re within mm -hmm. one building, Footprint. some kind of color scheme or mm -hmm. something so at least then maybe once you are on the right path, you would know kind of frequently used uh, locations or something. Um, but it's, it's certainly a challenge, but it's great you're thinking about it. Yes. I'm sorry. The, uh, the most frequent color blindness is uh, red-green. Mm -hmm. And they both turn to, to brownish. brownish. 
but if you do yellow blue, that there may be some people who are colorblind there, but there'd be fewer, a whole lot fewer. Yeah. Good point. So we're unfortunately out of time, yes. but I, we did want to leave you with some final yes. resources. So there's a bunch on our website, uh, courtinnovation.org slash procedural justice, including a little three minute animated video mm -hmm. about what procedural justice is. So when you go home tonight and you tell your spouse about this awesome presentation you saw <laughs> and they say, well, what's procedural justice? You can play that for them mm -hmm. um, from our YouTube channel. And then I also did, just as a shout out to the judges and the court officers who participated in the study, want to show a little snapshot of the bench card that we mm -hmm. created and the things that they agreed to do to yes. promote the project, things mm -hmm. like um, thanking defendants for being on yes. time, right? So we're going to work towards making mm -hmm. the wait better mm -hmm. and shorter, but in the meantime, we can also show respect mm -hmm. for their time by thanking them for being on time mm -hmm. and similar things. So. Um, there will be a study that's published about all of this. This is sort of hot off the presses. Um, so in the coming weeks, that'll be on our website as well. So anyway, so with that, I want to thank Lisa for thank all of her you. work on the project thank and you. for coming and presenting with no. me. And thank you all. And thank, thank you, you all. so much. I would also like to thank our presenters and for you uh, for coming and participating with your questions and comments. Uh, speaking of comments, we'd also like to remind you to go to the app and please rate the session. Um, but thanks again. This has been tremendous in it, uh, helping us to think through these processes is brilliant.